What's up, guys? Welcome, day three. In Bayesian cognitive modeling, or learn with me, or I guess me learning with myself, but using live as a way to stay accountable to the whole thing. Just set up here, and pull up the book. Uh, pull up today's exercises, so let's pull up this over here. Like I said, welcome to the my channel again. Uh, just going through and doing live sessions where I practice doing some modeling for conducting Bayesian inference for cognitive models. So we're starting with some simple examples where we're just looking at different ways to approach simple problems. Like say we had, we already talked about here. So we're just looking at parameter estimation, right? So we looked at inference for binomial processes already where we were looking at the success rates um, represented by theta and we were estimating this single parameter on the basis of the data we observed in this case or in the early cases it was we had observed the success rates and we observed the tr number of trials and then we even showed in those last examples that we could also estimate these processes using only information about the success rates. And we estimated how many sample surveys there were, as well as the success rate. Or, no, we had information about the success rate. We, oh, the, we had information about the number of successes, right? We didn't have information about n or the underlying parameter of theta. So let's get, we'll just get right into it again. We're going to start today. We're going to do inferences of Gaussian processes. I'm thinking that we could just do all the examples here. That seems like a reasonable amount of time. I'm looking forward to chapter five. It looks like we'll get into conceptualizing some more commonly used or conventional statistics here, like correlations. No, but this is a lot of fun. I haven't put too much prep into <laughs> really getting this, what I'm gonna say sort of thing. So I, I know that moving forward and streaming or like making actual c concrete instructional videos, it's gonna be something I'm gonna wanna do, just planning out the videos in advance. But right now, this has been fun, just setting up the streaming software and messing around with the code. I thought yesterday went really, really well for day two. Um, day one was really challenging, just even setting up the processing of the code and looking at the visuals. I think the visuals are really important and yesterday we did a good job at streamlining the, the pipeline such that we were able to get visual feedback on the inverse probabilities, so the posterior distributions. And that was really useful, and that's part of I think my learning process here. Just you know, outright stating my prediction about what is going to happen, and then seeing in real time what happens. Coffee, of course. All right. If you're not familiar, I have the online textbook here, which I found online, and I have the in-person textbook or physical copy of the, the book that I, I use when I follow along as well. Um, all right. This is a pretty common problem because Gaussian processes are what we use a lot in modeling continuous data. 
using these first two moments, the central tendency and the spread of the distribution. We have the take a look at the graphical model down here. At first, just we're looking at the mean and standard deviation, right? So the first two moments of a Gaussian distribution, and we want to infer. Oh, we're, that's what we're inferring. And we've gathered data. And here we have all the observations. So sub i indicating a given trial. And then we are modeling the priors here. The mean is Gaussian with mean 0. And Winbugs parameterizes the Gaussian distribution with precision, though precision is deterministically related to the variance. So they use lambda. I've seen tau also used commonly, or I'm in a actually in a Bayesian applied Bayesian class now in my department, and we use tau, but whatever. Just have to keep that in mind. So 1 over standard deviation. So this is supposed to be weakly informative. So one thing we can note is that this Gaussian process, or this, is a example of what a uninformative prior would look like for modeling the mean. This is very low precision. So low precision, low tight, means large variance. That's the relationship between the two. So sigma here, we're using a uniform distribution from 0 to 10. And then our data is model Gaussian mean 1 over sigma squared, which is the precision. So the Gaussian script implements this in bugs. We're going to use the JAGs for because I'm on a Mac and I think it's just easier to use. I have, that's how I have things set up. Dope. Actually, let's just go pull this up in our, our studio. So I have my R project here. And I'm just going to also practice talking through you know, opening our studio and explaining some of the particulars here because I think that's going to be helpful moving forward when I want to start using these or creating more instructional videos rather than just me studying and hanging out. All right, so I have it in books. And I got this code straight from the website. Um, I can show you the website here, too. Oh, man. Don't mind my, don't mind my lab's research. I should do that. The website here. I just found the code right here. Right. And we're in parameter estimation. And we're looking at Gaussian. And then we're going to look at the Gaussian R script. And we're going to need the text file, which has the Jags, jag in it. I don't know what to call it. The model. And in our studio, the recent one of the recent updates allows you to do this source panel where you can have two 
different sources open. I like that so I can look at this code while I'm thinking about the script. So I can't figure out how to get this to stay yet. To be fair though, I haven't really looked too hard. All right, so now I can have this nice over here, this full text file, while I'm looking at this over here. I'm just going to set the... I'm in here today. I'll set this as my working directory. This is easy because while I'm in an, a project, and I'm sure I could do some... I could write out a piece of... Code so it knows where to go. This is not the right one, Matt. I need this. There we go. Let's say that. So, like I was saying, I could write out a piece of code up here or something that identifies the directory properly because I, I'm in an R project here. So. It could. It knows where the vicinity to look on my local. From my understanding of it, it knows where imprecisely to look on my local, though it's not um, fully specified. And because I'm just going to be working in the pro Gaussian folder folder all day today with the exercises, it's just easier for me to use the interface and then set the working directory. Which I think people should take advantage of some of these interface features like window, folder, stuff. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah, let's see. So here's the, the JAG then. And we can take a look and just read through what the, JAG, the script's doing. So the data come from Gaussian process, so four I. So we're using a for loop here to represent a series of observations. So for i and 1 through n, we have an observation. So this is our, I'm not sure what to call the data structures here. If they're map onto what our terms, we have like a list or some kind of data structure. And we're going into the structure. I think it's a list. Um, and each one observation in the structure is i. and it's we're saying it's just normally distributed with mu and lambda because lambda is what the JAGS uses. And we specify our priors for each of these. So mu, so as we showed before in the in the textbook, we can derive lambda from sigma. So we also want to set priors for sigma because sigma is actually what we cared about in our graphical model, right? but we use lambda because to get sigma because that's what the to generate the distribution we need lambda yeah so we, we estimate lambda and from lambda we can get sigma i think or we use sigma to estimate lambda they work they work together i'm not sure the order or if it all simultaneously i think it's a it's called a declarative language or something where it doesn't matter the, necessarily the order of any of this. Anyways, so this is uniform distribution 0, 10, and then lambda is just represented. And we use this to say it's deterministic, right? So it's not probabilistically, we're not distributed by some probability distribution, but we use information about sigma here in order to act, get information about lambda. And using that information about lambda then, we can model the data. Good. So I guess we can just save on source, right? And save. We can take a look here. I think it's just print. 
let's print our samples. Oh, spell samples right. Here we go. We get information about mu and sigma, standard deviation. Nice. Looks like everything's working programmatically. So we're ready to get started here. And so just to specify some, some of the finer points here, x is the data we observed, n is just identifying the length. Data here is, so as it says here, nicely documented is just to pass this, the JAGS. And then we initialize the chains. So if we had multiple chains, we'd want to do multiple initializations or We'd have to initialize multiple starting point points for the parameters we're going to estimate using the sim sampling approach. And then the parameters here we're going to be looking at are mu and sigma. So we want to specify that. This is the drag, chains, iteration, burnins, thinnings, samples. So thins is sampling not every observation, but we could sample 10, every 10, or sample every 100, etc. Burn-ins is that initial starting period um, when we're sampling. So maybe we don't want the first couple uh, samples because they tend to be, well, they're dependent on one another initially, or they look more dependent, or they can be. So we can not use that information um, because they're so auto-correlative to one another. I'm setting the and then number of iterations then we have here and number of chains. So doing this multiple time, multiple chains. We're just doing one chain for the sake of the example, but more chains, more more precise. And then this is just extracting information from the bugs output. I also want to note moving forward that something I'm excited to do or I want to do more is also take examples of the stand code. So today might be actually a good day to do that because we're only doing three exercises. So let's try to answer some of these questions and see, let's see how it goes first. All right. Try a few data sets, vary what you expect the mean and the deviation to be and how, and how many data you observe. What happens if I just click plot samples? Oh, that's kind of cool. It's not really nice though. Maybe we can take from the code from yesterday and get some nice plot examples. I think survey or survey or JAGS maybe. I think we had some nice examples of plotting. I could also just do some quick plots. So I could do something like this.
wonder if I can do it. Oh. It doesn't look like it's spitting out the plots. Still nothing. So there I was just making it so that I could get some quick plots like I was talking about earlier. It really helps to get the visual feedback about what changing the parameters does. So I just set it so I'm going to get some density plots for the posterior distributions for mu and sigma. And I use this package called Patchwork. Patchwork is just a way to put multiple plots together with intuitive syntax. So here I'm just printing p1 and 2 and a Punch them next to one another. It's cool about that. Now I can start changing some of the other things about the data as the graph. So let's just observe more data. Let's say we observe. Serve a lot of data. Like a sequence. From one. Let's make sure I get this right. From one to five. by a hundred
do that because I do this. A lot more data. So we saw increasing data, increased uncertainty. It looks like mu is around here before. I'm using way a bit less three. It makes sense because 200 observations, we're moving from one to five. Somewhere in the middle is about three. Did sigma change? Sigma doesn't look like a change, but it just got more close. Hmm. Interesting. Let's change the priors instead. What happens when we make it more precise? So we're increasing the precision here. It looks wider now, it's about a hundred. Very wide now, right? Yeah, the scale, keep in mind the scale keeps changing here. It might be helpful to set some limits on these. Ranges. Just so we're getting at the same plots over time. Or like similar plots for interpretation. When the scales change, it kind of just fuzzes with you. So I just need the x limits to not move. Right, because sigma is specified to be between zero, so I don't actually have to. This is way too wide. I could do like two here. I'll be able to see everything. Yeah. You could even do one here. Good. And now for mu. Now let's see, 0 0.001, back to where we were. So now we move this. There we go. So now we can really see what happens. So not really impacting that much. if we do this. Now 
we see that effect happening where there was a little probability of sigma being around there before, but now basically flat line. Looks like we're very reliant on the data here. See how I added that value was very much far out relative or with respect to the other values, and that really increased the spread of these distributions. Yeah. Now it lets me. So, what we saw, we can see how the standard deviation and mean move and when I increase the data, I also got wider distributions, right? So now it wants me to plot the joint posterior. Plot the samples from mu against those of sigma. So this is a good exercise use case because it wants me to go back and potentially use some of the code that we had from last time. So I know that binomial, we modeled the joint distribution for these. Let's see if I can use the same code to get Actually, I don't want any of that. I wonder if I can just do this. So think about it, a joint distribution. Just looking at a scatter plot. Since the cool part about patchwork is I'm gonna be able to do something like this. This is gonna be my third chart on the bottom.
So here we have a joint distribution is mu plotted against sigma. Most of the data centralized around here at low variance, so very precise estimates of the mean around this area. Yeah, and that's sort of what we see up here too. In our density plots, we see very precise estimates. Suppose you knew the standard deviation of the Gaussian was 0.1, but you still wanted to infer the mean. For example, knowing the standard deviation might amount to knowing the noise. The x values could then be repeated measures for the same person and their mean trait value. Modify the bug script. Okay. So it's saying that I don't actually have to estimate sigma anymore. I know what sigma is. I want to modify the bug script to do that. It's like a lot of modifications I'd have to make, right? So I just need the mean. And this is going to be equal to still equal to lambda. But lambda is going to be something I'm able to calculate in my R script. So it will just be a, a value I calculate in my R script instead. So to do that, I don't need that information anymore. But I will need something over here. Sigma is equal to, it says 0 0.1. 0 0.1 or 1. And then we calculate lambda and sigma. Lambda also needs to be passed into the drag. And we don't need that. And we're only going to be monitoring mu. And we're not going to be plotting any of those.
Yep. So now we just model new. And there you go. So it shows lambda here is equal to one. Why is lambda equal to one? All oh, right, because one over sigma. All right, it's one squared over one one. Yep. Cool. Also, the graphical model, then. Well, actually, it would be cool if I could whiteboard it. I don't really have a cool whiteboard feature, but I guess I could make a note. I just Googled whiteboard. All right. We could try to draw it. It's, it's pretty simple. I mean, it's just going to be All right. New. We're going to be pointing to. X. This is trials. And this is going to be modeled Gaussian. Zero and then precision equal to. Uninformative mean or mu. X is then distributed Gaussian with mu and one. So it's one over sigma squared, which in this case, sigma squared is equal to one. One over one is one, so this is what we did. Nice. Do the board. It's kind of cool. And we have to figure out how to use that in the future. Oh, I think my. Let's take a look. I think my. Yeah. My air conditioner started going off, so, so that's why we have this sort of uh, sound effect now in the back. I still don't know how to get that to go off. So suppose you knew that the mean was zero, but wanted to infer the standard deviation. Suppose you know that the error associated with a measurement is unbiased. So the average mean is zero, but you're unsure. Oh gosh. Looks like I'm getting a phone call. Sorry. Hey, what's up? Uh, are you streaming right now? <laughs> yeah, I'm streaming. Would you come down and help us finish it up or no? I guess not. No, I, I can do that. What, are you close? Hey, throw up the BRB. Got a BRB. BRB. There you go. BRB, right? BRB. Is, that, is that streamer? Pat, you have to teach me how to do the streamers thing. Yeah, it's 
like those girls those have like a like a, a whatever, just like an art some some like BRB design. Like a so sign. Like, yeah, I gotta I'm gonna make a BRB. Yeah. Note to self. But yes. okay. Yeah, we're like where are we? We're on Ray Street, we're at that light and we're gonna be making a right onto Silver and then going in the alley. Okay. All right, I think I can, I don't know if I can stop my timer, but my features, my timer sucks, I guess. But all right, I will, I'll come out. Wait, no, can you call me when you're closer? Okay, I mean, I was going to be calling you in like a minute, but okay. Oh, okay, I'll just come out. Once again, we're doing the same thing as before. We're just going to model instead of the mean, we're going to do sigma. And so we're interested in inferring sigma this time. And the mean is going to be equal to zero. So the way to do that is just sigma. sigma. So yeah, we're just changing everything out so that we're now we're passing mu because we specified what mu is here. Has to not do this. When we're specifying mu still, we initialize sigma, and then we're only interested in seeing sigma. in an hour but I gotta go help with some groceries really quick so I'm just gonna I don't know what else to do I'm not gonna pause the stream this is my first leave but here I go
Have you had a pickle chip before? And we're back. Okay. We got an error. So the issue was the value I initiated, initiated for my chain, it couldn't be zero. Don't know why. One more. Yeah, one more. There we go. So we've estimated sigma, and we know my we know the mean. Here, the way the jag would work, or the graphical model would look, is just that we would have sigma here pointing, no mean, and then we would specify this here. But instead of mu here, we have a 1. Good. The seven scientists is the next problem. So let me open up the text files. Look at the JAG and the text file here. I'm just going to steal some of the code from our last example here so I can get some printouts again. The printouts are pretty useful. Oh, we won't source it yet. Right. So like this. We're estimating mu and sigma again, so we'll just get samples for those and we'll do the two plots again and heck we'll even plot the joint distribution between the two because we can it looks like the data the range of data here I'm just gonna look at this to try to get a sense of how I should specify the range for these plots and we got one like twenty seven, really far off base. So we'll do like negative thirty to thirty. Just to make sure we get Sigma, I'm not really sure. So we'll do it negative ten to ten. Interesting this. We have priors or we're stating an 
distribution for lambda rather than just calculating lambda. So I'm going to have to explore the text for why we're doing that this time. Oh, we're calculating sigma. So we have seven scientists. These two are not good at getting measurement quality. The other ones are seem to be hitting 10, around 10. So the problem here is to find a posterior over the measured quantity telling us what we can infer from the measurements. To infer something about the measurement skills. So we, we have two main problems. Let's look at the problem using a graphical measurement or a graphical model. So all scientists have a Gaussian distribution with different standard deviations. So here we're saying that the average for each of the scientists is going to be the same. But the variance around the measurements is going to be different for each scientist. So only the standard deviation is what's going to differ across subjects, but they should all average out. So like we noticed before, it's we have a different approach for assigning the priors this time. So instead of using a uniform distribution for sigma, we use a gamma distribution for precision. So here mu is distributed as a mean zero, precision, uninformative, and then gamma, this is what I would imagine is a uninformative prior for lambda i, so precision for subject, and then we have sigma, which is determined by 1 over the square root of lambda, and we have for a given subject Gaussian distribution, the average, and then precision for that subject. Common mean, different precisions. So for each subject, when the i, x, it's normally distributed mu lambda i. So for example, scientist 1 has the same average, but a different precision. And the priors are uniform. So we have mu here, normally distributed. But then because these things can vary, across each of the peoples, we have to specify priors for each of the individual scientists. So we have seven priors here that are, we use a for loop to specify. So lambda for one individual, boom. Lambda for another individual, boom. So we do this so that this can vary up here. So we're able to get the standard this way. We're going to get seven different estimations of the precision or the spread of the measurement. So we're going to get information about the level of uncertainty from each of the scientists' measurement skills. This is just some information for why we might be motivated to set a prior at gamma. This.
So let's take a look at the questions. Draw posterior samples to reach a conclusion about the value of the measured quantities and about the accuracy of the seven sign test. Huh? All right. Well, first, let's not do any of that. Let's just print the samples. Oh, so in this case, we're going to get a posterior distribution for each of the seven scientists. So we get an average of nine. So like the data set, it seemed that the average of Average measurement was around 10, but we have different scales of precision. So sigma for this first scientist who scored a negative is very spread. What would be cool is to plot this. So I wonder what happens if I do this. Sigma ends up being a list of six jags. I wonder if I can plot each column. So I'm just looking up, is there a simple way I can just plot each column of the data frame onto the, the graph? This is probably going to look really good. We're, we're going to use melt here. reshape. So the reshape package is a way to move things from long to long format to wide format. And if you're not familiar with those, and you know, there's plenty of literature out there explaining it, but essentially just imagine wide format is so that each column is representative of a predictor in itself. So in this case, each column represents a posterior distribution for each scientist. And what we want is we want to change this to long format. So now, Might not be what I wanted.
Let me just get some good syntax for mouth. I don't know what this one to ninety nine is. I guess it doesn't matter. All I really care about here in this data frame is that it's identified each of the seven scientists. And we have sigma. This is just observation counts for each of the clusters, which you have 999 of. Yeah. So now we're just gonna we can put some names on it. scientists and we also have observation number try or sample oh, man why am I butcha I'm not gonna use my names
Good. No way. Oh, that's kind of cool. I wonder if you can plot densities. This is just a plot time series option. That's like a base R thing, I think. Or part of the stats off. Yes, it's. That's kind of nice to see the frequency sort of thing. But I'm really, what I was looking for is just plotting each of the density curves. I think because of how different the distributions are, we're having issues. So that's good, right? Where I'm glad we decided to model this this way.
Well, that's kind of lame. I sort of don't know why it's giving me such a lame plot. I was hoping to get density distributions for each of the folks here. But I guess we'll just do hist. Let's see. At least give me a decent histogram. Instagram is pretty lame. Bending pretty far out now, to be honest. I'm just banking on. Like, I'm bidding more than data we have, which is probably not a good idea. In fact, it's really not a good idea. I'm just looking for a nice graph, to be honest. One of these dang scientists. You. But if I did density, I bet if I do density. Don't mind me here. I'm just messing around now. None of these values can be zero. So to get me some nice graphs. Okay. Nicer. Something that might be informative when making these graphs is just looking at this. Let's give it time.
basically what we're assuming here is that how different these are in terms of precision. Because I can't even plot the how wide the the deviation is. So big. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with the procedure of plotting here. So I just change the data set so that I have a data frame here, which plots all the posterior sigma values and then gives me one for each of the scientists. However, because of how vastly different they are from one scientist to another, I'm having trouble just getting some scaling here. But you can see some people are more precise than others. Oh, I guess I can do facet. I didn't think about that. I might be able to just scale free. So even with scale spray, I'm getting weird plots. Yeah. But nice. Well, not that weird now. You can see the range for these still goes far out, right? Farther out for some than others. This is probably the most accurate representation I've gotten so far. Scientist one, crazy and precise. Nice. That's a good. That's actually not a bad graph. Change the graphical model. So we, what we infer about the accuracies of scientists is that they vary substantially from one another, right? With some for scientists being more precise than others, some for scientists need to really up their training game, it looks like. So now change the graphical model to use uniform priors over the standard deviations, as was done in figure 4.1. There. We should just get a big standard deviation then, I imagine. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at sigma, but instead we're just going to estimate sigma how we did in the last example. So we don't need this. In fact, I can actually just go take some of the code from the last one.
So now, now we're doing Gaussian common mean and common precision. Model mu, ba ba. And we need to specify sigma, right? I can check looking at this code here. Yeah. I see. We still need to do it this way because they're distributed here. Yeah. There we go. So we get an upper bound sort of measurement. And I imagine if I just increase this to 20, we're just going to get another upper bound. See, it just keeps going up. So 30. because our observations facilitate that. 16. But notice each of these examples, the mean's pretty stable, around three. That's pretty biased, right? Think about up here, we're getting a mean around 10, but now the mean that we're getting is closer to three. That's because we're not accounting for the variability across the scientists in the same way we, as we were before. We're saying that there's a common measurement for the standard deviation. And so we're seeing that reflected because we're not accounting for that variability. It's being reflected now in our estimation for our mu as well as sigma. Cool. So it, it impacts inference here, but it makes it our we have a bias that we have an even more biased estimate for mu, and we also had an estimate that's very reliant or seems pretty reliant on the uniformity or the sigma distribution. Like every time I increase the space of possible priors, my sigma went up by you know. Quite a bit. But it looks like 16 is about where it's going to go for a very large sigma. All right. So that's it for the scientist example. Looks like next time we're going to work on the repeated measures. So we're going to stick in the Gaussian chapter and we're going to start repeated measurements for IQ. So we're going to be looking at a set of people. We've gotten multiple IQ tests. So this is repeated measurement in that for each subject, we have multiple measurement occasions for the IQ tests. So here, that's what the graphical model identifies where J tests. So for observation ij, i is a subject. So for a given individual, we have multiple identify multiple 
i key tests my key tests are represented by this square and then they are nested within people and we think that the variability for the measurement or what is this saying think about it. Look, at, look at this one right so we want to model the sigma across tests but we want to model the mean across people so each subject is going to have their own average IQ score and each test has its own variability accuracy of the testing instrument in measuring one's IQ value right so there can be substantial heterogeneity in the accuracy of the testing instrument and we want to assess that here by looking at the variability in testing scores and we want the estimate for a given subject on these tests right and the reason why we do it like this and why we're estimating sigma straight from the data rather than accounting for it, it varying across people is that this is supposed to be a property of the testing instrument. So it should be the same in terms of variability across test scores. So we'll get into that next tomorrow. That'll be exciting. All right. So thanks for listening to me. I hope that you know today was a little all over the place. I got really stuck in trying to figure out this plotting thing for these scientists. But, you know, that's really what it's about because I was able to explore the data and I saw differences in the uncertainty across each of the scientists' measurements and you know, playing with the code. So, you know, we're in here, we're making it through the book. We have plenty more days, so no rush. So I'll see you guys tomorrow then and we'll continue off with the IQ example. All right, signing off.